Okay, welcome back to Software Engineering 1. Um, so we're continuing to talk um, a little bit about coding practices and architecture. And in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about what's called the solid principles of software engineering. So um, last time, we spent a little while talking about um, kind of the, the new age distributed nature um, of microservices. Um, and how microservices uh, serve a lot of different uh, purposes. Um, and so we sort of went through A, how they're structured, B, how they're different from uh, sort of standard applications that you may have seen uh, in your time in college. And we also talked a little bit about why um, software organizations are interested in that model, uh, particularly from a, a revenue perspective. So. Um, microservices and distributed computing as a sort of client-server, um, multi-tiered application concept um, is really a sort of macro-level uh, concept. And so what we want to talk about next um, is some very kind of specific micro-level coding practices um, that are helpful when you're just trying to write some code. So it isn't necessarily a really uh, huge scale thing. Um, you're just trying to write a single specific component maybe to a larger software system. Um, and so solid principles um, are really applicable um, at, the, at the smaller level. So um, the principles in uh, SOLID are really focused primarily on uh, understanding the impact that requirements changes have on specific pieces of code and how to address those impacts um, by creating software that is as agile as the processes that we talked about uh, several, several weeks ago. So um, this is a really, really well-known set of principles. Um, you can see TED Talks about SOLID. There are books written about SOLID. There are tons of research articles written about SOLID. Um, and basically, it boils down um, to these five main concepts. Uh, the first one is single responsibility principle, then open closed principle, Liskov substitution, inter uh, interface segregation, and dependency inversion. So what we're going to do is we're going to go through really quickly what each of these actually means, and then we're going to give uh, some examples or maybe some intuition about why um, it's it's a reasonable thing uh, to sort of think about when you're trying to code. So uh, the idea behind single responsibility is pretty straightforward. Um, the idea is that if you have a class, that class should do one and only one job. So if you think about the consequences of breaking this principle, um, once you have a class that has two jobs or three jobs or four jobs or five jobs, um, it becomes really difficult to take a bug and figure out what class that bug goes to um, because even though it is a printer uh, spooling bug, it could be in a class that implements a whole bunch of different functionality for uh, the printer driver. Um, so it becomes harder to understand where in the code a feature is implemented and where a bug could actually occur. Um, but it also um, can uh, minimize um, the impact of, uh, or it can hinder your ability to minimize the impact of requirements changes. So um, if you um, find a, uh, a requirement and that requirement changes two or three or four times, um, every time you change uh, the code to reflect the requirements change, um, you're potentially changing code that's used by um, three or four or five different areas of the system. Um, and each time you do that, there are ripple effects to all of those other um, subsystems in the, uh, in the software package. Um, it also makes it more difficult to write automated unit tests. Um, so the smaller your classes are, uh, the more likely they are to have only one job. The more likely they are to have one job and the smaller they are, the easier it is to actually make sure that you're exercising all of the code in the unit um, with an automated test. If um, you have a whole bunch of things that a class is trying to do, you could certainly write more unit tests. Um, but as the number of jobs that the class has, increases, um, the likelihood that you're going to miss a code path increases. And so if you remember from the testing module, um, there is a concept of line by line testing, but there's also branch level testing and code path level testing. And so the more jobs your class has, the more likely it is to be really complicated. And the more complicated it is, the more likely it is that you're actually going to miss one of those code paths um, and leave something untested. <clears throat> 
Um, so the um, this is fairly easy concept to understand as a software engineer. It's um, maybe less easy to understand from a project management or a BA perspective. So you can really rephrase this in a different way um, for the business team potentially um, as you should only really ever have a single reason uh, to change a class. Um, so there should only be one type of requirement or there should only be a very small subset of requirements that could change that will trigger a change in this class. Um, if you notice that uh, you have a whole bunch of uh, requirements changing and every time one of these seemingly random kind of requirements changes, you have to go back and change the same central uh, class that usually indicates that you've broken the principle um, and you should take that central class that keeps having to shift um, and break it into multiple classes that can be um, maintained over uh, a shorter period of time um, with fewer changes to fewer requirements. Um, so ultimately, why is single responsibility even a, a thing that you should care about? Um, right out of the gate, you realize that if you have multiple uh, jobs to do, it's going to take more code to do it. And so that class is ultimately going to be larger, that class is going to be more complicated, and is going to have many more classes that are related to it than otherwise. So if you are breaking um, uh, sub, uh, sub module boundaries and you're trying to access multiple parts of the system from the same class, um, even if they're sa the same kind of ideas expressed in the class, what's going to ultimately happen is instead of having a ripple effect to maybe two or three classes, you're ultimately going to accidentally change code that's accessed by 15 classes or 20 classes. Um, and then uh, trying to understand the impact of changes is going to be really, really difficult going forward. So um, what you don't want to do is you don't want to have a situation where your class has multiple jobs around uh, different functional units. So when that happens, um, you can actually uh, break interfaces between functional units. And so not only are you rippling uh, across multiple classes, um, and then causing a whole bunch of code churn, but you're also causing potentially a lot of breaking changes uh, at the integration level. So if you remember in the implementation uh, module, we went through the fact that uh, implementation is kind of easy until you start trying to tie all of your implemented pieces of code together. Um, and if you have uh, classes that span multiple boundaries and you're constantly kind of breaking those interfaces, um, that's going to uh, lead to a lot of problems uh, in the implementation and also in the maintenance phase of the project. Um, and uh, it, it's also true, and we kind of talked about this in the microservices um, lecture, but if you can think of applications as uh, units or as layers, um, it, it isn't necessarily true that your whole application becomes obsolete all at one time. So uh, what can happen is your whole application is entirely fine, but you accidentally use an outdated, uh, potentially uh, uh, persistence component, or you're using an outdated UI, for example. And so if you have cross-cutting uh, classes that have multiple responsibilities, it's more likely that you're going to have to do a lot of refactoring in order to pull out some of this older code and replace it with newer code. Um, so if you have uh, adhered to single responsibility and sort of don't have cross-cutting concerns, then uh, what can happen is you can have a sub-team dedicated to upgrading the database layer, or upgrading the UI, um, and you don't necessarily lose a lot of time um, spent refactoring code, and you also are less likely to introduce is issues um, into the code base at large um, because everything is kind of segmented into its own layer or its own um, uh, kind of functional unit. So um, the next thing is the open and close principle. Um, and the idea here is that um, if you have a component, so you can call this a class, for example, um, if you have a class, it should be open to be extended by other classes. So that class should be um, used as a base class, for example, for, a, for an additional piece of functionality. Um, but it should not necessarily be open uh, for modification. Um, so in general, uh, what this is trying to say is if you um, get a change to a requirement, 
you don't necessarily want to have a situation where a new feature requires a fundamental change to an existing piece of code. Um, and the reason you don't want that is because if you already have the code live somewhere and people are already using it, um, you don't want uh, regression impact for existing functionality just because you introduced a new piece of functionality. Um, so the idea here is anytime you want to extend functionality, you would be extending a software component by creating uh, a derived class, or you would be uh, implementing uh, the same interface in a slightly different way, um, but you would not necessarily be going in and actually changing the implementation of the original code component. Um, so this one is a little bit less common uh, to kind of think about um, in maybe the code that you've seen before, um, but if you've had an internship or if you've uh, spent some time in industry, it makes a lot of sense. Um, if you uh, have maybe version one of the system um, that is out in the world, and then in version two, um, a person or a client says, hey, it would be really great if we were, were to add a new piece of functionality that's extremely similar to this existing functionality, um, but it is slightly different. Um, in general, it would be easy to go and just modify and maybe add uh, an if statement or a, a configuration switch or something um, as a code path that allows the original piece of code to implement either or um, functionality. Um, in that case, though, what you can ultimately end up with is a bunch of stacked up requirements um, that ultimately will con contradict each other. Um, so what you can uh, end up with is a client that screams because the button is blue, and then another client says, hey, but the button should be green. And then a third client says, oh, but the button should be orange. And so now you're in this situation where um, you've gone back in, and instead of uh, introducing some extended functionality where you can set the color of your own button, um, you have hard-coded it potentially, or if you've used some sort of if-else uh, uh, conditional logic uh, to understand what the user wants. Um, and by, in doing so, you could potentially break uh, one person or one client's concept of a fully functioning piece of software uh, by introducing a bug fix for another client. Um, and that's a situation you don't want to be in because then a patch for one client becomes a bug for another client. Um, and you just end up in these giant circles of a client always being upset about something. So um, what you want to see is a situation where if you get a whole bunch of feature requests and those feature requests are along the same lines of each other, um, you would see um, a generalization appear in the code base where you have a central piece of code that's a base class or it's an interface or it's a, a generalized factory or something. Um, and then there are ch child classes or derived classes or some sort of specialized implementation. And that specialized implementation extends the base functionality um, into all of these additional new features. Um, and so instead of replacing functionality, you're extending functionality and you're doing that by keeping the actual original implementation closed. You're not allowing people to go in and modify um, that piece of code unless there is a bug, right? So if there's a bug, you can go in and fix it. Um, if it's an extension request or it's a feature request, you don't want to change the code um, because it's not a bug, it's, an ex it's a feature and you want to uh, provide additional functionality with additional code and not modify what's already there. Um, potentially the uh, strangest or the kind of the hardest one to get around um, is called Liskov substitution. Um, and the idea behind this uh, particular concept um, is that anytime um, you see um, an implementation that has a parent class substituted uh, or parent class in the implementation, you could replace that parent class with any subclass of the parent without breaking the application. So um, we kind of need to define what breaking the application is here. So what we mean by breaking the application is we mean that it will compile. So um, breaking the application means that you can actually run it. It may do nonsensical things um, because of the implementation that you've provided. Um, but in general, the concept is that you want um, that uh, input parameters for subclass methods uh, do not have more stringent validation. So you can pass through uh, parameters to uh, derived class methods the same way that you would to the base class methods. 
and the output parameters for subclass methods um, have to have at least the same amount of validation or the same uh, business rules applied to them as their parents. Um, so it's called uh, inversion uh, in a lot of cases because the ideas um, are a little bit backward from what you would kind of think. Um, and the reason that they seem backward is because a lot of the cooked up kind of academic uh, ideas around uh, inheritance kind of break Liskov substitution. So you're, you're, uh, you're taught a deviant case uh, from the very beginning. Um, so uh, the idea um, behind why it's important um, is it's to minimize, minimize coupling and maximize uh, reuse. But if you think about the kind of quintessential example of where this comes up, um, is called the square rectangle problem. So um, you have almost certainly uh, written a program somewhere um, that considers a square to be a derived class of a rectangle because a square is just a specialized form of a rectangle. Um, you could have a square derived from a rectangle, you could have a rectangle derived from a square, um, either a restriction or an extension. Um, but in either case, um, what you uh, don't really want is you don't want um, the uh, input parameters to the methods on either of those classes to deviate from one another so that you can't perform substitution. So instead of uh, relying on a direct inheritance relationship, um, the way to adhere completely to this kind of substitution is to have a third kind of intermediary class um, that would typically be a quadrilateral or something more generic than uh, a, a rectangle. Um, and then both the square and the rectangle would derive from that third uh, parent. And what happens now is you're completely free um, to implement whatever um, kind of validation you want um, on either of those derived classes. Um, but uh, in either case, you can put, um, you can do the substitution um, and you don't break anything. Um, so you don't necessarily have the uh, more specific, less specific uh, implementation. You basically just have an implementation of a more abstract thing. Um, and so if you take a moment to kind of think through the difference between having square, rectangle, or rectangle square, and uh, having a quadrilateral square or quadrilateral rectangle or vice versa, um, you can see how a natural consequence of doing that is you're gonna decouple square and rectangle. Um, they're gonna have a common parent, um, but they're not necessarily going to share a whole bunch of uh, validation. They're not necessarily gonna share a whole bunch other than a common parent. Um, and so what happens um, is you're able to reuse uh, squares and rectangles and whatever in place of a, a quadrilateral um, and you can do so uh, without a, a lot of uh, issues um, and you don't necessarily have to worry about runtime failures caused by validation issues for inbound parameters. Um, so interface segregation is another one that is uh, pretty straightforward. It kind of makes a lot of sense. Um, if, if the general concept is that um, you, you're much better off if you have a whole bunch of very small interfaces rather than one interface that is 10,000 lines long. Um, and the concept behind this is that if you have a class that implements an interface, that class should never have something like a not implemented exception. So you should never force an implementing class to skip a method that is required by the interface. Um, the, the reason uh, behind this is that when you're skipping methods in your implementing class, that usually means that your domain boundaries between entities um, are misdrawn in the application. So uh, this is kind of an abstract concept that may not make a whole lot of sense, um, but you can kind of think about it as uh, database tables and models. Um, if you have a whole bunch of uh, inherited uh, implementation from a, an interface into a model, and that model doesn't actually do anything uh, with the business logic around the methods required by that interface, um, it isn't actually a member of the entity family that that interface is intended to provide a contract for. Um, so um, this leads to things like 
uh, factories not really functioning. Um, you can uh, try to build a class that has a common interface, and you can end up with a class that doesn't actually uh, provide an implementation for the interface method that you need um, through the construction. Um, so what you can, you can kind of generalize this and you can think about it from your perspective in the class. Um, you've almost certainly used uh, third-party APIs, so you've probably looked at uh, libraries uh, in uh, like Microsoft or Google's APIs or whatever, um, and you'll notice that there will be um, interfaces to kind of tell you how classes are related to each other um, and the sort of uh, methods that are available to you. Um, if you have a single, uh, a single interface in your API and that interface is inherited by every class in the entire system and there are 200 methods on that interface and only two of them are uh, implemented for each class and each two of them are different, it's a different two, um, there's going to be a really hard time uh, trying to understand how the code actually works. So um, interface segregation certainly helps uh, internally. You can uh, certainly uh, make sure that your domain boundaries are drawn correctly and that factory implementations will work for your code base, uh, but you're also helping people who are going to ultimately use your code base understand what the heck is going on without trying to create a whole bunch of uh, objects and then have a bunch of exceptions returned to them that uh, the method that they think should actually be there isn't. Um, because uh, the interface that was used by those objects is too big. Um, the next one is dependency inversion. Uh, so this is another fairly abstract concept, um, and the, the definition is basically that um, abstractions themselves should not depend on your implementation, um, and instead your implementation should depend on the abstraction that it's coded to. Um, and so this is called inversion because you would think uh, that you build a concrete thing and then you abstract that concrete thing into a generalization. Um, and that is conceptually the way that a lot of code is built. Um, but what you don't want to do is actually implement the code in that way. Um, so it's actually easier to think about this um, as a, a kind of unrelated uh, maybe metaphor. So um, if you think about being uh, maybe in your room uh, alone in the dark, um, you definitely don't want to be in that situation. You want to turn on a light. Um, but in order to do so, if you didn't have basic abstract concepts of uh, electronic devices, um, you would have to uh, break out a hammer and then hammer through your drywall and then find the wire and then cut the wire and then figure out how to solder that wire onto um, the wires for your lamp and then you would have to do all of this sort of like hard hard wiring and all of this electrical work um, in order to actually light up the room and this is not clearly the way that you want to live your life so um, what you would rather do is you would rather have um, an abstraction uh, for that electrical nonsense in your wall um, that is expressed as an electrical outlet. So you kind of have this expectation that there is an electrical outlet um, and that's an abstraction because your wall is going to be different from everybody else's wall in uh, the world, um, but the electrical outlets usually by country are basically the same. So. Um, basically, what it does then is it takes all of the complexity of how your house is wired and boils it down to the fact that if you have a plug that fits into that um, electrical outlet and um, it uh, meets the amperage and it meets the voltage requirements, um, it will actually work. It will light up the room. Um, so in this situation, uh, the power grid for your city or your municipality um, is uh, wired all the way into your house, um, and the power grid inside of your wall is coded to that abstraction. Um, so um, there is some understanding of uh, standards and procedures and all sorts of stuff for electrical engineers, and at the end of the day, they are the people who put everything together and they provide you an outlet that gives you access uh, to that power. On the other end, 
um, you have a lamp that's created by some dude in a factory um, that is coded to the same abstraction, um, but the lamp doesn't actually care about how the wires in your walls are run, and the wires in your walls don't care about the color of your lamp. Um, these are completely abstracted things. They don't actually care about each other's implementation. What actually matters is that they are coded to the same abstraction. And that is the whole point of dependency inversion. What you want is you want these uh, junction points to be um, abstractions that either side of the boundary can be coded to. Um, and if you are very good at adhering to dependency inversion, this is a pattern that makes um, uh, that makes integration during implementation way, way easier um, because you know that there is a standard abstraction um, that allows you to pass data, in this case, um, through from one side of the wall to the other. So um, at a, at a kind of high level, um, that is the whole concept behind Solid. Um, so it, there are lots of nooks and crannies in Solid. Um, like I said, there are books written about Solid, um, and there are lots of different kind of concrete, very niche, very specific ways that you will see it come up in industry. Um, but the, it doesn't really stop there. Um, so in general, there's a huge study of software architecture. There are textbooks on software architecture. Um, there are journals. Um, there are societies. Um, and basically, this is an area of uh, software engineering that has maybe constant turnover uh, around what is the best practice of that particular uh, type of system, um, what are the best patterns, what are the best principles to use. Um, and in my experience, um, this is where uh, sort of continuous education as a concept uh, benefits you the most as a software engineer. Um, the things that you read uh, today as the uh, industry standard sort of cutting edge thing um, will be laughable, eye-rolling nonsense uh, 10 years from now, maybe five years from now. Um, so there are major things uh, to think about. So uh, remembering uh, the benefits of uh, keeping interfaces tiny. Uh, the benefits of abstraction as a concept to help you with integration. Uh, concepts around um, inheritance properties and uh, the, the direction that inheritance should maybe happen in your system. Those are important things to think about. Um, and even if you don't like memorize solid and you can't go through it uh, like by heart, um, these are all kind of things to continuously kind of think about, um, and you can actually even uh, develop over time patterns and practices of your own um, that may be industry standard at some point. So um, one of the things that is um, kind of really well studied and really well um, sort of documented and thought about in addition to SOLID is a concept called GRASP. Um, this stands for General Responsibility Assignment Software Patterns. Um, and the idea behind GRASP is that SOLID gives you these concepts of how to structure code. Um, GRASP gives you concepts about what specific pieces of code should be doing. Um, so it's all about uh, responsibility delegation. Um, and ultimately, responsibility delegation is where you get uh, things like uh, the MVVM and MVC coding patterns that we're going to talk about in the next video. So um, if you have uh, seen uh, many of the, the UI development uh, frameworks like Swing or SWT, um, uh, Xamarin, all of these kinds of uh, uh, front-end development toolkits uh, that feed into a back-end um, typically have layers that are implemented in some kind of pattern like MVVM or MVC. And the ideas around those patterns really stem from the assignment of responsibilities. What layer should be doing what portion of work in the system? Um, and that's specifically what we're going to talk about next time. So if you are interested um, in learning more about GRASP, um, you can go to this Medium article. Um, this is a very succinct and sort of very good resource um, about GRASP. Um, I didn't want to kind of maybe drag everybody along, but if you're interested in software ar architecture, this is a great resource. Um, and it also has uh, some infographics and things that kind of make things make a lot of sense. So.
In the next video, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about MVVM and MVC um, in, through the lens of, of kind of responsibility delegation, but also how they can help you uh, maintain software and build software that you can actually use for a long, long time um, without um, maybe having problems with cross-cutting concerns and things like that. So um, I will see you in the next video. And as always, please let me know if there are any questions, comments, concerns. Um, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks.